Okay, so again, I want to thank the organizers. And I'm going to talk about the question of why there are sex differences in psychopathology, even though brains do not have sex. And actually, I'll be presenting mainly uh, the work of others. And when I'll be, when I be presenting my work, I will say so. And I want to start with something I think uh, we can all agree on. And this is that uh, psychopathology is a result of complex interactions between environmental events and genetic susceptibility factors. That is, the same environmental event may have different consequences in different individuals depending on their specific genetic background. And to this statement, I want to show you today evidence leading to the next statement, which is that the effects of environment and genetic variation on brain structure depend on sex. So I'll show you evidence from other laboratories uh, pointing to this conclusion. And combining these two statements together, we get to the conclusion that we may expect sex differences in psychopathology. And I will show you a study from my laboratory how the same manipulation leads to different psychopathology-like consequences in male and female rats. And the second part of my talk will be to show you how the, how the same conclusion that the effects of environment on brain structure depend on uh, sex, how this leads also to the conclusions, a conclusion that brains do not have sex. Okay, so I start with the effects of environment uh, uh, on the brain depend on sex. And I want to start with an example. And this is a study from the laboratory of Peg McCarthy, uh, who tested the effects of chronic stress on the uh, density of cannabinoid receptors in the hippocampus. And what we can see here is that the effects of stress are different in males and females. So if we start with males, that you see that the non-stressed males in white have a high density of receptors, whereas following stress, this level of receptors is decreased. And the opposite exactly is happening in females. So they start with a low level of, re of uh, receptors, and following stress, the level of receptors is increased. So the first conclusion is that the effects of stress on the brain depend on sex, so they may be different in males and females. If we now look at the ventral hippocampus, because up until now we were looking at the dorsal hippocampus, then we see that also here the effects of stress on the brain depend on sex, but the, but the specific relations between stress and sex are different here. So if you see that here again, stress decreases the density of receptors in males, but it has no effect in females. So a more general conclusion would be that the uh, specific stress by sex interaction may be different for different brain regions. It's not, it's not that the sex is modulating the brain uh, or the effects of stress in the brain the same everywhere. And I want to show you another example of this second general conclusion. And this is a summary diagram uh, of many studies on the effects of chronic stress on different regions of the rat brain. And what I want you to, sh uh, to look at is that we can see here that the effects of stress may be opposite in males and females. As example, uh, the effects of stress on dendritic arborization in, on uh, pyramidal neurons in the prefrontal cortex, and also here in CS3 region of the hippocampus. But the effects of, sex, uh, of stress may also be the same in males and females, as you, we can see here in an in increase in the spine uh, density in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. So we see again the general principle that the effects of stress on the brain may be modulated by uh, sex, so they may be different in males and females, and that there are different stress by sex interactions for different brain regions. Now, there are many studies like this showing the effects of stress, of both acute stress, chronic stress, stress that was experienced in utero, but usually by stressing the mothers uh, or the dams because it's rats, uh, just after uh, uh, rats were born or in adulthood. And such effects were demonstrated in many brain regions. In the hippocampus, the amygdala, many different regions of the cortex, uh, the cerebellum and corpus callosum, and also the hypothalamus. So many regions of the brain show these complex interactions between stress and sex. And many different characteristics of the brain show such, uh, 
sh such stress sex interactions. So uh, the size of a uh, region may be affected this way, the neuron density, uh, dendritic morphology I've, as I've shown you, uh, receptor density again I showed you. So many different features of the brain may show these sex dependent changes. There is a lot of studies about stress, obviously, but there have been also other studies where, with other manipulations. And I'll show you just one case of a change or manipulation of housing conditions. So this study is from Janice Draska's lab, and I think she should get the credit for being the first, but I may be wrong, there are people that may know the history better here, but I think she was the first to realize that the effect of the same manipulation may be different in males and females. And in this study, she compared the brains uh, of rats reared in isolation, so individually, to rats that were reared or housed in groups, and also had a different objects replaced every day, what we may now call enriched environment. And what you see here, and I will not go into the details, what you see here are five brain features. The first three rows are different layers of the visual cortex, and the on the second row on the left, we see some measure of the hippocampus and on the right of the corpus callosum. And what I want you to appreciate in this figure is that the effects of housing conditions are different in males and females, or may be different. So again, we see that the effects of the environment depend on sex. And again, we see that there are different sex, uh, environment by sex interactions. So on the right hand side, we see a similar effect of housing conditions in males and females, and then in the middle, uh, and on the left, the males seem to be more affected uh, in the corpus callosum, actually the females are more affected. And in the hippocampus, we see that males and females are similarly affected, just in the opposite direction. So again, we see the same pattern, and now with housing conditions, and not with stress. So this is very general. Up until now, I just show you the sex environment interactions. And I, I have found only one study that actually shows the triple interaction environment, genetic variation, and sex. And this study tested the effects of stress in a, a transgenic mice model of Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see here is that there was an increase in amyloid beta only in females and only following stress. So we see the interaction of the three factors, genetic variation, environmental factor, stress, and sex that determine brain pathology in this specific example. So what I've shown you thus far is that the effects of environment on the brain, and now you can understand why the genetic variation is in bracket because there are much less information or data for this. So the effects of environment and genetic variation on the brain depend on sex. And this can lead us to expect sex differences in psychopathology. But as you may well know, the relation between structure and function in the brain are really not straightforward, they are very complex. So it doesn't have to be this way. And what I want to, to do now is show you that the effect of a manipulation on brain function, that is on behavior, also depends on sex. And, and this is a study conducted in my laboratory in which we tested the effects of uh, early uh, postnatal administration of fluoxetine and SSRI. So we administrate rats pap with fluoxetine from day uh, zero to six for seven days. And then we tested their behavior at specific time points. And I only show you the behavior at the age of 90 days and three months. So they're already grown ups, they are adults. Uh, the drug is long, no longer in the system, of course, so they are drug free. And we just see the effects of the early manipulation on their behavior when they are adults. And again, I will not go into the details, but what you can immediately see is that we see here the same pattern that we saw on brain structure. So uh, in dark or in black, it's uh, fluoxetine treated rats and in white, uh, the vehicle treated rats. On the left, you see females and on the right, males. And what you can clearly see is that the effects of fluoxetine on behavior this time depend on sex. And again, we see that there are different fluoxetine by sex interactions for different behaviors. So for example, with activity, males and females are similarly affected with an increase in behavior following fluoxetine administration. Uh, you can see behavior that are affected only in males, only in females, or at the bottom, uh, that are affected opposite, in opposite directions in males and females. So we see the same pattern, that the effect on brain function 
also depend on, se depend on sex. Before leaving Israel and coming here, a colleague of mine, Michelle Sloan, sent me this slide. She heard me talk, we had a conference of our department, and she heard me talk and she said, okay, you need to have this slide. And what she has been studying for many years now is the consequences or the consequences of the political violence in Israel on both Israeli and Palestinian kids and youth. And she's a clinical psychologist, so this is what she's doing, and she has developed um, some scale to measure the degree of exposure to political violence, such as bombing, being in the shelter, and things I hope you will not experience yourself soon. And, um, and she has developed this scale, so if you want more information, you can have the reference down there. And this is the figure she sent me. So what we can see here, uh, the level of post-traumatic symptoms in boys and girls experiencing low levels of uh, political exposure to political violence and high level of exposure to political violence. And what we can clearly see that uh, the degree of exposure doesn't ex uh, affect the level of symptoms in girls, but it did increase the level of symptoms in boys. So we see here, again, an interaction between environmental conditions and sex slash gender. Because of course, in humans, we don't know if it's, this is a biological difference or a gender difference, because males and females are expected to react differently to this threat. So this may be mediating the effect. So I want to be very clear that we do not know if this is a sex difference, but with humans, we never can never differentiate. But I think this really nicely demonstrates that also in humans, we should look to sex differences and similarities in the, in the effects of different environmental factors on psychopathology. Okay, so to summarize this part, uh, I've shown you that the effects of environment and genetic variation on brain structure depend on sex, so they may be different in males and females, and that this, these complex interactions between these three factors may lead to sex differences in psycho psychopathology. And what I want to do now is show you how the same fact that the effects of, of um, environment and genetic variation on the brain depend on sex, how this leads to the conclusion that brains do not have sex. And to explain this or to understand this, we first not need to understand why some people believe that brains do have sex or why some people believe that there are male brains and female brains. So this is what I'm going to talk about now. There are many sex differences in the brain. In fact, we've just seen a few, right, in the microanatomy of the brain. But there are also differences in the size of the brain, in the size of specific brain regions, um, in several neurotransmitter systems, and of course in the microanatomy of the brain. And there are probably hundreds or thousands of such sex differences. And many people take the existence of these sex differences as evidence for the existence of a male brain and a female brain because they implicitly assume that these differences are adding one to the other to create a male brain and a female brain. But in doing so, they implicitly make two assumptions. The first is, is that if a brain structure is affected by sex, this means that this brain feature or structure has two forms, a male form and a female form. And this is best exemplified in the common use of sexual dimorphism. So whenever a sex difference is found in behavior or in the brain, but we're not talking about the brain, so whenever a sex difference is found in the brain, people immediately talk about sexual dimorphism. Dimorphism meaning having two forms. So this is the first implicit assumption. And the second implicit assumption is that the sex or the form of the different brain features within the same brain is the same, is consistent. So for example, if I have the male form of the amygdala, then I will also have the male form of the hippocampus, cortex, etc. And I want to suggest that uh, these assumptions are made because they are almost true for the basic levels of sex. What, what I would call 3G sex, that is the genetic, gonadal, and genital levels of sex. And if we look at only these levels of sex, we first notice that they are highly dimorphic. So for example, uh, gonads usually come in one of two forms, either it's an ovary or it's a testis. And it's very rare that this is not the case, and we have people with an ovotestis, 
but this happens. And if we encounter an individual with an overtestis, we do not label this person as male or female, we classify this person as intersex. Similarly, the uh, different levels of 3G sex are highly internally consistent. So for example, if someone has uh, the female form at the genetic level, this someone is highly likely to also have the female form at the gonadal and genitals level. And again, it is very rare that this is not the case, as for example, in complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, which I show up here. And again, people like this, that they have both male characteristics and female characteristics are termed intersex rather than male or female. Now, the number or the percent of intersex in humans, which is highly controversial, but I think like 1% will be uh, an okay estimate. So it's very low. Most people are male or female and not intersex. If we now go back to the brain and to the hundreds or thousands of sex differences that we see in the brain, we can now say that there will be a male brain and a female brain, like, just like there are males and females, only if the different levels or the different sex differences in the brain are highly dimorphic and highly internally consistent. If they are not, then most brains will be intersex. Okay, because the fact that only nine, that 99% of us are male or female and not intersex is exactly because 3G sex is highly dimorphic and highly internally consistent. If it weren't, we would all be intersex. So what I want to do now is ask these two questions. Are sex differences in the brain highly dimorphic and highly internally consistent? And I will start with the latter. So <clears throat> what I want to argue is that the, our conclusion from 10 minutes ago, that the effects of environment on brain structure depends on sex, is exactly the same as stating that the effects of sex on brain structure depend on environment. This is a correlation, so you can read it either way. And if this is true, then we should expect poor consistency between the sex of different brain regions. And again, an example is almost the best, at least for me. So let's use a formal example. So this is the same example we've seen before, the study for Peg, from Peg McCarthy's lab. And we saw that stress affects the brain differently in males and females, but now we're going to change our focus. So now we're going to look at sex differences instead of the effects of stress. And what you can see here is a sex difference. So in non-stressed rats, males have a, a higher uh, density of receptors compared to females. So if we want, we can talk about a male form, which is high density of receptors, and a female form, which is low density of receptors. And we can see that following stress, this sex difference is reversed. So now the females have what we have just thought was the male form, that is high density of receptors, whereas the males have what we have just thought was the female form, that is low density of receptors. So the first thing that we can conclude from this example is that the effects of sex on brain structure depend on the environment. Under different environmental conditions, the effect of sex may be completely opposite. And I think this is important to remember, especially following Art Arnold's question from the previous session, that sex is doing something. So it may be sex chromosomes, it may be sex hormones. I don't know who, which part of sex, of 3G sex or further on with sex, has this effect. But clearly the effect of sex, of the cell being XY or XX, having high testosterone levels or low testosterone levels, this is modulated by the environment and we can have the exact opposite effect under different environmental conditions. If we now look at the ventral hippocampus, what we can see is that it is not that stress flips the brain from being male to being female or the other way around. So in males, again, we see that, uh, so again, we see that there was a sex difference in the ventral hippocampus, and you can see that following stress, this sex difference is eliminated. So, Males and females have the same form because males now have the female form, if you want. So stress is not flipping the whole brain, but it's affecting different regions differently. And this is the same conclusion we had before, just reading it opposite. So there are different sex by stress interactions in different brain features. So if we assume that the form of the hippocampus uh, in non-stressed males was male, and the form of the hippocampus in non-stressed females was female, 
then following stress, the male rats will have a female hippocampus, whereas the female rats will have an intersex hippocampus if you want. So they'll have dorsal hippocampus with a male form and a ventral hippocampus with a female form. Now, the male rats will also have an intersex brain because it's not that their entire brain is it's changing following the stress to be female. So the hippocampus is, in this feature, is female-like, but the rest of the brain is not. So you can see how this complex interaction between environment and sex disrupts the internal consistency in the brain. And as I've told you before, there are many such studies showing uh, the different manipulations can reverse or eliminate a sex difference, as we have just seen. But a manipulation can also create a sex difference, enhance an already existing sex difference, or not affect a sex difference. And what, as we, we saw already, the same manipulation typically has different effects on different brain features. So even if we assume that at some magical point, the whole brain was internally consistent. Let's say the whole feature, all, all the features of the brain were female, then following these different events that can happen from the moment on concept, of conception throughout life, as I've shown you, then following such events, some features of the brain will change their sex and some will not. So we will have a brain composed of a mosaic of both male and female characteristics. That is an intersex brain. So, the implicit assumption of internal consistency is not correct, and this, for, this is why brains are intersex rather than male or female. But what about the first assumption, the assumption that brain, brain features come in two forms? So, many researchers have already pointed out that uh, for most brain features, there is no sexual dimorphism, but actually a high degree of overlap. And this is especially true for the human brain. And if we take, for example, uh, this nucleus, which is considered the human analog of the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the rodent. So this is human data from swab labs, lab. And what you can see here is that this nucleus is twice as large in males compared to females. So this is a large difference in the human brain. But you can also see that there is a high degree of overlap between males and females. And Again, that you cannot distinguish a male form from a female form. But I want to go even further and claim that there may be many more than two forms. And it seems that, when, again, when people talk about sex differences, they immediately think of two forms. And I think the best example for this, to, to think differently of this, is to talk about something that we all know, and this is height. So clearly there is a sex difference in height. Males are typically, or on average, uh, high, taller than females. But we cannot talk about a male height and a female height. People can be short, very short, medium-sized, tall, very tall. So people can come in different forms. The fact that there is a sex difference doesn't necessarily mean that there are two forms like we see for the gonads, for example, or the genitalia. And the same is true for the brain. So probably most features of the brain, like dendritic density, dendritic morphology, density of neurons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are more like height like, than like the gonad. Okay, so they do not come in two forms. And if we go back to this slide and just look at it once again, so if we get, again look at dendritic morphology in the prefrontal cortex, we see that following stress, it is decreased in males, but increased in females. So at least for this brain region, we can speak about three forms, right? In the stressed male, in the non-stressed condition, and in stressed females. So that we already see three different forms. So brain features do not come in two forms. And in this sense, brain features do not have sex. You cannot talk about the sex of a brain feature. It has many forms. It doesn't have only one of two forms. So we actually should replace this view of the brain as intersex, as composed of male and female characteristic, with something that is more of this type. So brain forms can come in diff many different features, and the brain of each of, of us is a complex mosaic of these different brain features, which are affected by sex, but they do not have sex. Uh, and this is why I say brains do not have sex. So, you know, first level is brains are intersex if you really need to attribute sex to everything. But if you can leave this and go further, then it is senseless to talk of, of the sex of the brain, even though brains are affected by the sex, by the 3G sex of the individual. 
Okay, so, so this is something I think it's quite complex, so I want to reiterate. Brains are affected by sex. I think it's really important that we recognize this. Brains are affected by sex, but they do not have sex because the way they are affected by sex are very complex and depend on other factors. And I think it will be easier to remember this if we change our terminology. And I think the most important thing to do is get rid of the words sexual dimorphism, especially when this is really the case. So you can really see separation between males and females, and you can, you know, justif it's justified to talk about sexual dimorphism. But when it comes to humans, I think there are no examples for sexual dimorphism. Clearly in behavior, there are no examples, but also very few examples, if any, in the brain. So get rid of this term. I think it's really... Um, um, misleading because it leads to the assumption that there are two forms. I also, also have a problem with the term sex differences because it also implies two forms or two groups. And I actually prefer to talk about the effects of sex. And just for an, an, uh, uh, an analogy, if we were having a symposium about age in the brain or stress in the brain, we will not have a session on age differences in the brain or stress differences in the brain. We will simply be talking about stress effects on the brain, age effects on the brain, etc. So I think we should start using this also for sex because sex is important, but sex is not dichotomous, especially not at the level of sex hormones, for example. And I think it's important not to throw the baby with the water. Okay, uh, so to summarize, what I try to show is sex is one of several factors that affects brain morphology and probably function, with the other facts, factors being uh, environment, genetic variation, and age, which I haven't uh, talked about. And probably there are other factors. And it is the complex interactions between these different factors that determine brain structure. And as a result, there may be sex differences in psychopathology. But this is also the reason one, why brains do not have sex. Uh, thank you. <laughs>